Well, hey there, folks. Welcome to the Caledonia Gathering Online. My name's Corey, and today we're continuing our conversation called Love Letter. Well, as always, we're so glad that you decided to join us today. You know, uh, it's our mission to tell people about the life and the love of Jesus and to inspire you to learn to live and love like him. And if, and if that's something you're interested in, you haven't done so yet, we really want to encourage you to hit that subscribe button down below. Now, before we jump back into our conversation from the Apostle John to his, his fracturing churches, this conversation on what it means to love in the world that we live today, um, we're going to get our hearts and our minds in the right place together by singing. So, uh, let's sing. Death that claimed its victory. The king of love had given up his life. The darkest day in history. There on the cross he made sinners. For every curse is blood. Final breath and it was finished. Not the end we could have known. For the earth began to shake and the veil was torn. What sacrifice was made as a heavy.
ago I got into an argument with a friend of mine over text and and I know I know a text-based argument is a terrible way to argue with people because all the aspects of a conversation aside from the words are absent when when you argue via text you're missing eye contact and body language and tone tone and volume and pretty much everything that makes it a human interaction but alas I, I did it anyway the argument was over belief and behavior C can you believe something without actually doing it and still claim to have integrity? Can, can you argue strongly that exercise is good and it's healthy and beneficial and everybody should do it, even though you've never exercised a day in your life? Can, can you argue that, that generosity is important and it's valuable and, and it does just as much good in the life of the giver as it does for those who receive the giving, but not actually give a dime away in your own personal life? Is it possible to believe something, but not follow suit on your behavior? I think you know this. The answer on the surface is, of course, yeah. It's possible to believe something and not behave according to that belief. I mean, our beliefs, our values are, are constantly in conflict with one another, competing for our time and attention and effort. I, maybe I believe exercise is good, but, but I just don't do it right now. Or I just don't have the time. And, and while I believe it, it's, it's not a top priority for me. But on a deeper level, wouldn't you have questions about someone who espoused beliefs that they didn't behave according to? Wouldn't you have questions about their integrity? I mean, would you want to listen to what they had to say about something that they didn't really practice themselves? You know, like, you should really exercise. I mean, I don't, but you should. Or, or, or you should really be generous and give. I mean, I don't, but you should. I mean, I mean would, would you listen to somebody espouse a belief that didn't actually inform or inspire their behavior at all? I guess if you think about it, this is most people's issue with the 21st century North American version of the church, right? It's hypocrisy. We could rightly be accused of thinking that so long as you believe the right things, you can behave however you want, even if it means behaving in anti-Jesus ways. And, and I'm, not, I'm not talking about the places where our, our mind typically goes, you know, you know, drugs, sex, alcohol, rock and roll. I'm not talking about that. I'm, I'm talking about the things that Jesus spent most of his time talking about. Can you say that you believe in him, but not behave the way he did or he invited you to? Like, like caring for the poor, the sick, the marginalized, and the vulnerable. I'm, I'm talking about that, that ultimate value of self-sacrifice for the sake of someone else, about going out of your way to love your neighbor, which Jesus redefined as, as meeting the needs of those who, who do not look like you, do not live like you, do not love like you, and, well, probably don't like you. I feel like maybe we've made it possible, as long as you stand up and say, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died to save me from sin, but... But then it's okay to continue to go on living a self-centered, racist, sexist, bigoted life where, where I do nothing for the poor and marginalized and I prioritize my own rights and freedoms over vulnerable and needy people. In some weird way, I think we've separated belief from behavior and gotten comfortable with that. To, to circle back to my text argument, is it possible to believe something that doesn't inspire your behavior? I think the answer is, yeah. 
But are those people compelling? Are we interested in listening to what they have to say? You see, this is the trouble that John was trying to point out for his churches. Remember, John, John's writing this letter to his fracturing churches, which are, are being torn apart by persuasive preachers. Preachers who are claiming to know the truth about God and how to relate to the divine and, and about what it means to be human and, and how to relate to one another. And, and they were also demanding that people choose their side on these issues. If, if you don't agree with me, you cannot be with me. But the point... The point that John is trying to make, especially in this letter, is that preachers who espouse a belief that doesn't inspire the behavior of love, which, which he will define for us, that belief that they're preaching is not a belief in God. Whatever those preachers tell you, says John, this is what you should know. God is love. And if we believe that, then we ought to strive to live a life of love too. Here, here's how he says it. Uh, Chapter 4, starting at verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that, that we might live through him. This is love. Here's his definition. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is what love is. It's not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's, it's the demonstration of sacrificing yourself for the sake of someone else, a sinful someone else, a broken someone else, a selfish someone else. That's what love looks like. It's putting the needs of another person, including those who are nothing like you, ahead of you. This is what God's love looks like. It's Jesus' self-sacrifice. Let's keep going. Verse 11. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. I mean, no one has ever seen God, but, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son into the world to be the Savior. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, then God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. And there's no fear in that love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen can't love God who they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. And everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the father loves his child as well. This, this is how we know that we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Now, there are three things that I want to point out here. Uh, first, the what of love, then the how, and then, and then the why. But let's talk about the what first. Two weeks ago, Zach delivered an incredible line in his message for us. He said, I love tacos, and I love my mom, but also, obviously I don't love them the same. Then he went out and point, on to point out that there are different kinds of love, family love, sexual love, friendship love, familiar love, and then there's this other kind of love called agape. Agape is actually the word that John uses for love in this passage, and he uses it 34 times in 15 verses. 34 times. Now, more than likely, you noticed that the word love showed up more than just a couple of times. But believe it or not, it actually is in the Greek text more often than the English translation. Where our English translation says things like, dear friends, the original Greek says beloved, agape ones, ones who are loved. Now, now what does this agape love word mean? 
Well, the good news is that John actually tells us in explicit terms how God defines agape love. It's the self-sacrifice of Jesus for the sake of someone else. Self-sacrifice for the sake of another. That's God's definition of love. So as we've done throughout this series now and then, let's, let's reread some of this passage, subbing in God's definition for the word love. Dear friends, oh, remember that's the word beloved. Those whom God loved, those whom Jesus sacrificed himself for, let us sacrifice ourselves for one another. Everyone who sacrifices themselves for the sake of someone else has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not sacrifice themselves for others does not know God. Because God is self-sacrificial love. We skip down to verse 16. And so we know and rely on the self-sacrificial love that God had for us. God is self-sacrificial love. Whoever lives in self-sacrifice for others lives in God and God in them. You see, for John, you can't separate belief and behavior. If your belief in God's love for you does not inspire you to sacrifice yourself for others, then you don't believe It's simple for John. They're completely intertwined with each other. You can say you believe it, but if it doesn't inspire your behavior, then John says there's there's some room to grow here. And and a belief without behavior certainly isn't a belief in God's self-sacrificial love. I mean, without that inspired behavior, that belief is never going to overcome a world that's driven by selfishness. Which leads us to the how part. How do we overcome a selfish world? I mean, a world in which we live and and that lives in us. You you rely on God's self-sacrificial love for you and then let that love inspire your behavior, inspire you to put the needs of others ahead of your own. I mean, that's how the children of God overcome the selfishness of this world, by living the self-sacrificial love of Jesus for their neighbor. And, And then John kind of adds this weight to it. He says that those who do this have nothing to fear on Judgment Day because they've lived in the world as Jesus did. That's why he says perfect love casts out fear. Remember from a couple weeks back, perfect doesn't mean flawless. It's it's more about completing a puzzle. When you encounter the idea that that God loved you so much that he sacrificed himself for your salvation, that, that you don't have to suffer the eternal consequences of your sin because of what Jesus did. And that Jesus has now invited you to live this entirely new life that looks like his life, a life that is truly the best kind of human life. Then your response to that love is the last piece of the puzzle. It's what completes the picture. And it's that completed picture which is demonstrated not by your espoused belief, but by your behavior. And that's what casts out the fear of God's judgment. The way the Apostle Paul put it was was that the results of the Spirit of God in your life is fruit like love, joy, and peace, agape love, self-sacrifice for the sake of someone else. You see, to claim to love God but then still hate other people is is to be inconsistent. John calls that kind of person a a liar. You, You can't believe in God's love and not have it begin to affect your behavior, according to John. Now, it's important to pause here and make a qualification and make it clear. We know for a fact that Jesus brought into his close fellowship all kinds of people who were at all kinds of different places when it came to their practice of loving their neighbor or their brother or sister. We know that that Peter, for example, was still a little racist even after Jesus rose from the dead and ascended back into heaven. I mean, Paul had to call Peter out uh, for his racism. He He tells a story in Galatians. The point is, wherever you are on your journey following Jesus, his self-sacrificial love should be our guiding light, our north star, the direction we are seeking to walk in. When John says that, that when we love as he loved us, that we perfect his love, he doesn't mean that we love perfectly and that we nail it every time. But instead, we're all on this path of following Jesus together and learning to live and love like him. None of us are doing it flawlessly. Wherever you are on that path today, great. But John's inviting you to take steps forward. He's not calling out your imperfection. He's calling out those who claim to be on the journey but have no interest in actually growing or going anywhere when it comes to the love of Jesus. But but for all those who believe in the agape love of Jesus, you know you're a child of God if you're beginning to grow in your self-sacrificial love the way Jesus loved you. So the what, agape love is all about self-sacrifice for the sake of somebody else. 
The how, well, not perfectly, but on the path to growing in love for others as Jesus loved us. And lastly, why? Why live this way? Why choose self-sacrifice for the sake of others? For one, it's the response we're invited to give by God. It's the response that, that indicates that we are his children. But secondly, and I think this is truly compelling, it's the response that actually overcomes, that, that can actually triumph, that could truly change the world. And I mean, you, you know this, right? And people who, who espouse beliefs that inspire their behavior truly inspire others. And, and that love can, can kind of unleash not just a ripple effect, but a tidal wave of self-sacrificial love in the world. Let, let me just give you a, an example. A few weeks ago, I read the story, the life story of a woman named Sudha Varghese. When Sudha was young, she read this article about priests and nuns who spent their lives working with the poor. Inspired by their generosity, she, she decided to become a nun herself in hopes of doing the same. So she joined the Christian faith and was instructed in the ways of Jesus, especially his propensity to love those who were on the margins of society. But inspired by the love of Jesus that she had learned about, Sudha decided to go and work among the Musahar people. Musahar means rat eater, and it constitutes some of the lowest of the low in society in India. They're literally called untouchables. They, they can't live in the same villages or go to the same temples or eat at the same tables or even use the same kinds of utensils as other people. All Musahar are considered so low on society's totem pole that they're even scorned and looked down upon by other people considered untouchable. And Musahar women have it even worse, being considered even lower than men. Once when Sudha was talking with a group of Musahar women, uh, she asked how many of them had ever been beaten by their husbands before. Every single one of them raised their hand. Sudha assumed that, that the people must have missed her, the women must have misunderstood. And so she asked the question in a different way. She said, well, how many of you have never been beaten before? No one raised a hand. You see, Musahar women were constantly under the threat of violence from their husbands and sexual assault from strangers. If Musahar girls were caught smiling or walking leisurely on the road, somebody would grab them by their arm and tell them that their behavior was unacceptable and sternly remind them, you are a Musahar. I mean, from the moment they're born till the day that they die, Musahar women are reminded that they are less than dirt and worthless to the point where girls assume that their place in any room that they enter is on the floor, not on furniture. Sister Sudha herself, she was subject to social scorn and rejection, even death threats for choosing to associate with the lowest of the low in society. But inspired by the self-sacrifice of Jesus, she continued working among them. And after spending 20 years working amongst the Musahar women, learning to understand their plight, Sudha started a free boarding school for Musahar girls, a place to care for them and teach them and to help them see that they are not untouchable, but that they are valuable people. Sudha insists on teaching the girls that they should study and they should play and they should walk around freely and safely and speak up for themselves. She says that when they arrive at the school, most girls keep their eyes on the ground all the time. Sudha says that, that it's, enough, it's hard enough work just to get the girls to lift their gaze. Teaching the girls their value and worth as though someone thought they were worth dying for, it, it doesn't stop with educational lessons or general care either. Sudha also made sure that the girls were taught karate so that they could defend themselves when attacked on the street. She says that, that actually most girls are confused about the idea of self-defense at first because they've been taught to simply just accept abuse. Their karate skills, though, began to impress their teachers so much that, that they asked if they could enter these young girls in a local karate competition. And Suda agreed, thinking it'd be a neat opportunity for the girls to travel. They ended up winning gold. With that caught that attention of, of a local politician who offered to pay for the girls to travel to Japan to compete in a world championship of karate. And they came home with several trophies. Talk about the last being first, right? But more importantly, they came home with the realization that, that they were not lower than dirt, that they were not less than human. 
but that they had value. They had significance. Girls who grew up believing that they were literally untouchable stood as audiences applauded and cheered for them, and in Japan even bowed as a sign of respect. The question is, how did this tidal wave happen? It was because Suda was inspired by the self-sacrificial love of Jesus. It moved her to go to the poorest of the poor. And what attracted her to Jesus in the first place? It was the self-sacrificial lives of his followers who were inspired by his agape love. You see, ultimately the point is this. John doesn't see a separation between belief and behavior. They are inextricably linked together. Jesus gave up his life for you. He loved you self-sacrificially. And now he's inviting you to do the same for others. I mean, this is what it means to be a child of, of our God. This is what it is to love God, is to show his love to the world. Because our God is love, we love others. But the question I want to leave you with this morning is, what would that love look like in your life? I mean, it's entirely possible that, that you're not supposed to go to India and work with the lowest of the low in society and teach them karate and all that. But, but what's his love inspiring you to do? You know, when those initial priests and nuns began working with the poor, they didn't know that their love would inspire somebody to write an article, would inspire a young girl to give her life to the Musahar people and literally change, save their lives, the, the lives of countless girls who were overlooked by the world. They had no idea what was hanging in the balance, what the ripple effect of their love would be. And neither do you. You have no idea what kind of ripple effect or even potential tidal wave of love is hanging in the balance of your decision to begin loving like Jesus today. An agape love, a self-sacrifice for the sake of someone else type love. Because you know what? I think it's that kind of love that has, that can, and that will overcome this world. Well, as you head out today to, to continue or to take that step in growing and learning to live in love like Jesus, knowing full well that, that you don't know what might be hanging in the balance of your decision to love self-sacrificially starting today, I want to send you off on that journey with God's blessing. So go with the love of your Heavenly Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen.